links with the American Mafia to finance an ambitious scheme for a big property development in London's Dockland. Directed by John McKenzie from a screenplay by Barry Keith, Helen Mirren co-stars in a role that's so much more than the traditional gangster's mall. The Long Good Friday is more than just a gangster movie. It marks a high point in British movie making. More than 20 years after its initial release, it's still considered to be one of the greatest British films ever made. I'm bringing together the cast and crew of The Long Good Friday. They haven't been together for more than 20 years. John McKenzie is one of Britain's finest directors. The Long Good Friday was his seventh feature, and he's continued to work in television and film ever since. Award-winning producer Barry Hansen lived up to his reputation for encouraging new writing and directing talent when he brought together the team to make The Long Good Friday. Simone Reynolds is the casting director who began her career at the Royal Court. This was the first feature film she'd cast. Derek Thompson played Harold Shan's right-hand man, Jeff. Since then, he's become a household name as Charlie Fairhead in the long-running BBC series, Casualty. In the 1970s, Barry Keefe emerged as one of the most significant playwrights of his generation. His controversial script for The Long Good Friday, set in Thatcher's Britain, eerily predicted the development of London's docklands. Hello, how are you? Long time not seen you. <laughs> Filmed as Margaret Thatcher took power, The Long Good Friday's release in 1981 marked the start of a new decade, a decade ripe with entrepreneurial excess and obsession with wealth. This was a film that said a lot about Britain. It was a depiction of a nation trying to find its confidence and be great again. John, why do you think um, The Long Good Friday still consistently tops the pool of the best films? Well, maybe because it's a good film. Maybe, <laughs> you know, uh, well, what is it? It's a, I suppose it's a mixture of lots of things. Huh? But it's really an, ent it's a, an involving film which uh, has terrific characters in it, great acting, I think, all round, and, um, and deals with, uh, in a very... Uh, not too heavy way with with serious issues and uh, and of all, and with humor so it's got a huge amount of ingredients which uh, actually attract and it's and it's a film it's not a television it's a film and i think that all those factors help so where did the original story come from you've got these these elements of london gangsterism and you've also got the much the, the explosive element literally of the ira I used to be a journalist in East London, and I, uh, the days I was doing my patch in East London was the days of the craze, and South East London was the Richardsons, and I kept hearing all these stories, all these stories, all these stories. Um, and I had this fantasy, I, yeah, I would like to have done a great gangster film um, set in East London. Then one day I was working with Barry Hansen doing TV stuff, and he said, what film would we like to go and see tonight? And I said, well, I'd like to see an American gangster film uh, set in East London. And he said, well, Barry and Barry Hansen, his way, said, well, write it. Uh, then thought, what's right? You need a story. And then the thing came together. What about gangsters that were doing it for money? And then, of course, it emerged. Uh, Harold Shand was the ultimate Thatcherite. The thesis for Longer Friday was gangsterism, and that was the Thatcherism, and that was capitalism, versus terrorism, idealism. I was writing it on uh, the Easter weekend, which is the most boring thing. It's the fastest thing I've ever wrote. It was in three days, and it was uh, at Easter. But at the time, could you have imagined that it was going to stand for an era? This was going to stand, in a way, for Thatcher's Britain? I knew that we'd made an important film. Uh, this, people came up and said, you don't realise the kind of film this is, as though we're all sort of like dense or something. <laughs> um, so it, we knew that it was kind of... <laughs> we knew uh, what it was, but remember, Margaret Thatcher wasn't in 
no. then, when the, when, it, when the film was shot, she came in in the autumn. Yeah. So uh, there, is an end of, uh, there is the end of the 70s, her coming in, yeah. this film being made, when in fact it's, it, you know, it's run its course. So it's a different kind of film to films that were started out in the 70s, like The French Connection or The Godfather or whatever. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a different kind of uh, energy to it. That's why I say it's not a cool film. It's raging, and in, somebody once called it, again critically, impetuous, and I took that as a compliment with the mm. film, because that actually was what it was, and it was a shout as to what is happening, yeah. and what will happen, and what, the, it, you know, what did the service industry and the manufacturing, that kind, all the ramifications of that. Let's deal with the whole Thatcher's Britain, because the context of it was very, very strong, and it probably doesn't hit you on first viewing just how strong that was, and just how much how was the Thatcherite. And, for me, one of the, 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 the clearest expositions of this is he does this fantastic speech on the boat. On the this is, I, I'm British, I'm English, this is my London. And it was a firm, as firmly as Woody Allen films are set in New York, this was a London film. I mean, how did you go about that whole creation of that character? Well, you know, an awful lot of it was in the writing, wasn't it? I mean, the, the, uh, the words were uh, pretty terrific. and. Uh, and said and written with a passion for the for the uh, for the whoever was going to play the part, but with a humour which was sort of there a lot of the time. But it was a sort of humour that would uh, uh, it wasn't sort of burst out laughing humour. You know, it was just really an undertone which could make the audience giggle, but accept the the believability of this character because he was all things. You know, this is what was great about that central character, and he was a monster. But at the same time, he was a lovable family man, you know, <laughs> and he was always hugging people, and then he would go out and shoot them. Uh, Harold is standing up there on his uh, fast motorboat, and he's making his speech mm. about England, about what he loves yeah. about the place. I mean, did that, a lot of that come mainly from you, or did Bob put into that as well? I think that was my speech. Uh, That's I was the speech you've always wanted to make. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think this buggered my chances of knighthood. <laughs> I'm not a politician. I'm a businessman with a sense of history. And I'm also a Londoner. And today is a day of great historical significance for London. Our country is not an island anymore. We're a leading European state. Yeah. You had that figure in mind as you were writing. Yes, indeed. Well, not Bob Hoskins, but I had that figure in mind. I wanted that kind of... I wanted to write a part for Humphrey Bogart if he hadn't been dead and if he'd been English. OK? <laughs> we have the accent. But look, that would have been in poor Bob Hoskins. would have been nowhere if I hadn't been for, uh, for the long Good Friday. If he gives me a fiver, I'll say the right things. <laughs> for you, Barry The film was shot in London, mainly around the Thames. John Mackenzie revisited some of the main locations. Well, here we are. Yeah, the Tower Bridge stands for Britain, for the Empire, for Harold Shand, a pillar of the Empire. And uh, so I had to find something, how, how to start the film. He has a huge speech in it, which he used to do somewhere around the dock area. So then I decided, well, a, a trip down the river would be great with Shan, the, the, the mighty pillar of the Empire, standing there, uh, uh, you know, with the bridge encasing him. And uh, so that's how the thing started. Uh, uh, that's how that big scene started. And we did it actually you know, sailing down the river all the time with the bridge getting smaller and smaller in the background. The worst thing in the world is filming on water, on rivers. And uh, the boats going, uh, you, you want to slow the boat up and you want to tell the captain to turn it round. And, and, I, and I would be shrieking, can you reverse the boat? He said, reverse, you don't use such terms. I said, well, make it go backwards or whatever you do. And we turned round, we swiveled around in midstream here. And we actually, at one stage, we, uh, hit the parapet, hit the, hit the, hit the bridge. <laughs> and uh, I thought we were going to sink the boat. But it's absolute hell. Boats and camera work do not mix. What I can't believe, we're talking here in whenever we're talking, I can't believe uh, Bob had a, uh, the Hoskins character had a speech saying this will be the Las Vegas of Europe. Yeah. In the last two weeks, we've exactly. found out we are going to actually yeah. the dome in Greenwich is going to be a casino. Absolutely, but also the Olympic bid. I had this vision 
of what was going to happen. And I cannot believe how accurate it has turned out to be. Well, you shouldn't go around giving them ideas like that. <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it had a, a, a tremendous class, the film, and that, a lot of that obviously was to do with the casting. So you were casting virtually, when you think about it, virtual unknowns. It's true, yes. I mean, I, I was very lucky to have worked at the Royal Court Theatre and to have um, learnt about casting, I suppose, in a really brilliant theatre. Um, and I was there for three years, and I suppose you know, we, we just discovered actors. We were sent all over London to, to watch performances. And, you know, for instance, Derek, I saw in Belt and Braces at the Half Moon. And there were a number of other people in the film that I'd seen who, yeah, were on the fringe. And, and it was very exciting to be able to bring them in. And, and I mean, the people, like, you know, the, 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 the people that, you know, obviously Derek, Helen, Mirren, Bob Hoskins, Pierce Brosnan, Gillian for the whole slew of people. I mean, sometimes you just get a film like that where it just kind of spawns all these stars. And it was the easiest part I've ever played, because I've played me. <laughs> you know I mean? When I look at it now, I think, oh my God. But that was me. That was, that was what I was like. Funny enough, I've never had any trouble with violence. It always it frightens the life out of me that it comes so easily. You know? And sort of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite a gentle soul, really. You know what I mean? What is it? I'm, I'm sort of carving him up with a chopper. <laughs> you know, and so seems like every day. We're another slice of toast. <laughs> you know. Derek, this for you was virtually your first television film. I mean, uh, yeah, it it was. I I I'd got uh, a bit of experience in television, yeah, which was, yeah. um, which is very different. This, this felt much more like a, a theatre text. But at the same time, it actually hit you so hard without being overemphasized. I just thought it was magic, I it was a, and it still is. It's a classic text. Tell me about uh, why you thought Helen Mirren was going to be good for this part. I, I'd seen her a lot in the theatre, and I was, admired her work very much. And um, I suppose we sort of didn't want to cast somebody who was sort of like a kind of Hollywood sort of star. Um, we wanted somebody who was obviously very attractive and glamorous, but who was a real actress. And I, I think that goes throughout the film, actually, that everybody we cast was from a sort of proper background of, of acting. I think we were very careful in the sense of who we picked even down to the Irish villain who turned out to be Pierce Brosnan of later years. Mm. But you'll see it was to do with people who were actually going to grab the camera as well and work on film because it was a film. And uh, so that was the, uh, uh, those were the two things we had in mind. An actor who was, or actress, or actors who were really great and who, who had the ability to do the part but who also had the ability to use the camera. What, uh, what Although The Long Good Friday was one of Helen Mirren's first film roles, she's since become a major star of stage and screen. You know, film scripts don't often read well. Uh, they don't need to read well. You know, they need to look well on the screen. So they're rarely a sort of interesting piece of literature. But, but Barry's was wonderful. It was very, very funny. Uh, it included some scenes that sadly weren't in the film. Um, wonderful scenes. But... Um, it was a pretty amazing piece of writing. The only big drawback was that the woman's part was crap. <laughs> As usual, you know, great parts for everyone, crap part for the woman. So um, I had a, you know, I had to talk to Barry about it and, and uh, John McKenzie and, um, you know, they said, yes, 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 you know, yes, dear. Um, and then, of course, I arrived back the day before we started shooting and the script was exactly the same as it had been. So I spent a lot of my energies on the set, kind of dragging that character into the story and, um, you know, insisting on scenes being written and being a real pain in the arse. A lot of the, lot of the time we had to put... She's right, we had, to, we had to sort of pull the script towards the woman's intelligence, you know, and the woman's... And the, and the, <clears throat> And the woman's sort of control of him in a way, you know. Where she, there, there's times when when she actually tells him exactly what he's going to do. 
I mean, I think I drove John Mackenzie mad, and, and very much to his credit, he speaks to me now. Um, because I was so sort of, and you know, it's not what directors want to hear when they've finally got their film off the ground and, you know, the light is going and they've got this boring actress whining on about not, you know, not having enough lines in the scene or something. Harold, your trouble is you just don't understand their psychology. Well, if you smiles, Pret. I can't talk to you. I'm going to bed. Good night. Well, come here. I'm talking to you. Don't treat me like one of your thugs. I think one of the things that made him who he was was his relationship with her. Like, living with her actually defined him. Do you know what I mean? And he, because she was such a strong character, now that's, that's what we said in the first place, you know, they, you, we're going to have to sort of strengthen this girl up, because Helen, you, you can't have Helen playing a bimbo, it just won't work. You know, she's too intelligent, obviously. She was very much the cipher, the girlfriend, the sort of acolyte, and uh, I, you know, obviously being greedy actress that I am, I, I wanted her to be central to the story and uh, in the plot that was a very important thing rather than you know actually someone we could easily cut out nothing would happen i want i wanted to you know self-protection i wanted to pull her into the story um, and make her proactive in the story i want to lick every inch of you <laughs> Saved by the bell. Good night. Saved by the bell was an unscripted moment. Yeah, that was a sort of improvised line. But mostly, you know, because the script was so beautifully written, um, it, you didn't, you know, it didn't need improvisation. It was a very tight script, actually. She wasn't just a glamour puss. She wasn't. And that's where it slightly varies from the more conventional American gangster films. But on the other hand, so, and that's what I think is Ingredient X, which makes it slightly different. But at the same time, it has a gangster-driven uh, feel about it and the development of story and sort of the, dr the drama of it is filmic, is, is an American movie. I mean, I intended to do that because I felt like him. I, I mean, American movies were the ones I wanted. I didn't, British movies were boring. The, the, what, the, what in terms of the relationships, the, the male-female relationships in this film, is quite a lot of restraint, because at no point do you see the obligatory sex scene uh, no. w w with uh, Bob and Helen Moon, no. nor do you see any kind of consummation of the relationship that she potentially could have had with you, and that was a really interesting tension in the film as well, because yeah. all the way through, first time you thought, there is going to be some kind of problem in this relationship, and it's going to be caused by sex. That's right, it, but, but uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't overthink it, but um, I, I thought about it quite a lot because there was something that struck me the first time I read it, that uh, quite often the number that you first think of is your, your instinct has actually found something that you, that, you, uh, that you can't quite determine, you can't determine clearly, but it's there. And it's a, it's a most wonderful script, it's full of so much nuance and, and subtlety and suggestion alongside the boldness that's there. That it's, um, but you're the young, educated I actually snapper. found in it. Well, what I'd found in it, and it took me a while to go back and find what it was that I'd, the, the kind of uh, flavor that, that, that first suggested, which was that I felt there was a kind of, there was a sort of unrequited gay, not fancying, but kind of uh, gay notion of, of the Jeff character's attachment to Harold. Um, I mean, I didn't say this at the time. <laughs> I didn't think. Well, I, I thought well, it was something that well, actually, because I thought you'd overexploit it. <laughs> um, I, I thought you'd that. have me dressing up funny. Yeah. Well, that would have been interesting. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I thought actually that the scene in the left. Um, I, I thought it's it, it's the only kind of sexy moment that I can see mm. in this, and actually, it's not about that. It's about it's it's political. It's about this man's. Uh, um, his, his interest for most of the film is actually in, in impersonating Harold and, and eliciting uh, uh, flattery yeah. uh, from, from Harold. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and he loves him. Yeah. Uh, and he, I don't suggest that he would die for him, but he's, um, he is a really kind of 
uh, he's, he's stuck on him. And the Helen, I think the Helen Mirren, the relationship with Helen Mirren is actually him wanting to kind of step into his shoes for a moment. It's not to do with him fancying um, the, the Victoria character. It's just, he can't resist actually saying, let me be the boss for a minute. Mm. Well, he's calling the reason for all this. You know how bitchy queers get when their looks start fading? I don't know. It wasn't my time. <laughs> How'd you stay so cool? I want to win inside. Yeah. Tell me about the look of the film. Phil May Hughes' uh, camera work. Tell me, mm -hmm. how did you decide and how did you discuss it? Uh, well, the idea was, in fact, I was just talking to... Derek earlier, was not to have a black, a, a, you know, a film noir type thing. I mean, I wanted to have a very, uh, almost reflecting Hal's character, glitzy, making London look glamorous, but, but real. And, and that's quite a, you know, you got, it's quite a difficult thing to, well, not a little more difficult than just making it, you know, film noirish. And uh, so he is, you know, I owe an awful lot to him for giving us this, uh, this look of it, you know, it looks like glitz, it's all bright, it's, uh, but it's not garish, or it's not silly, and yet keep the depth in and give it a sort of panache, a big film feel. You know, I said, I don't want to see a double-decker red bus, I don't want to see an old land taxi, I don't want to see one scene with mist. You know, we went right through all what we don't want. I want to see St. Catherine Dock with yachts in it, which were there, all that was London. And uh, that he captured and gave it this extra which no director can, you know, it's the lighting cameraman does that. We're exactly where I was about 22 years ago. Uh, the start of the Long Good Friday, yeah, was like here. We had a, there's a huge hotel back here, which is, which was just, just built there, and which I used as a camera platform. Uh, it's a pretty hideous hotel and still is, but it was handy for putting a, getting a high shot of the whole area, the dock, and we, we swung around from there and then panned right round until we saw uh, uh, Bob, uh, Harold Shan's boat was parked here. Location is important, yeah. I, I mean, the thing starts to take form then, take form in your head. You've got, you've got a real clear sort of uh, vision, which gradually grows and grows and grows. It's the real start of the film, I suppose, and it's, uh, it's, it really gives you the feel that now the thing's really going to go, you know, because the, the visions you've had in your head are now being transposed and, and made solid by the, by the actual locations. And, and it just, uh, it's that process where you get more and more ideas, ideas start to flow about what you can do and how you can make uh, uh, even strengthen a scene that's, uh, that's, that's good but needs some other ingredient. So it's a, it's a wonderful process, I love it. It's the real start of the film, really. The main problem was there was a marvellous scene, uh, uh, a more spectacular sort of scene in the pub, in, uh, in Harold Shan's pub, but, and everywhere we went asking people could we have their pub, and they said, oh yeah, that's fine. I said, well, uh, we just start with blowing it up. <laughs> <laughs> which didn't go too, down too well with most of the landlords. So eventually I came up with the idea that we'd build it. So we built the pub on the river, in fact, not far beyond this building behind me. Uh, interior as well, although it had no back wall on it. But it was so realistic, the cars drew up. <laughs> And they got out of the cars and we'd go in and order. And I would say, I'd be in the middle of a shot, and I'd say, no, hold up, can you just cut? Uh, gentlemen, that's fine. Do you not notice there's something wrong with this pub? They didn't even notice there was only a tarpaulin on the back wall. So it was really quite... Yeah, and so that was, a, uh, that was one big difficulty, getting that particular location. Jesus. We've been five minutes earlier. I was saying a minute ago about how locations are terribly uh, important and actually uh, build the whole feel of the film and, and, and helps you enormously. But quite often, of course, the unexpected happens, and I suppose that's the whole thing about filming. <laughs> it's always unexpected. Uh, so you've got to actually go with the flow, as it were, and sometimes great moments come out of that. Tell me how you did the, uh, 
the scene in the abattoir when you have all these uh, small tiny oh, yeah. cooks upside down? Sure. Well, I think, as far as I remember, uh, you know, I think that was certainly scripted and, and planned. But, I mean, the thing that I remember, because you always remember what you contributed yourself, don't you? I mean, just sit around the table and listen. And I, yeah, I remember the certain things which stick in your mind. And the only thing I remember about it was, uh, apart from the smell of the abattoir, my God, how we survived that, I'll never know. But was, I noticed when the trucks arrived, they, uh, they had, the, the meat truck had the, had the line, uh, rails on them which attached to the rails inside the, the, the cold storage thing. And uh, you could wheel them straight from the truck into the cold storage. Uh, hanging upside down. Well, that was improvised on the spot because I thought, God, great, we don't have to bundle these guys out of a thing, way, out of a van, then put them upside down and hang them. We'll have them hanging like that, and the rails will. So I never knew, of course, we never, none of us had been in abattoirs and meat trucks before. So that was the thing that was new in the sense. And then the other thing that was new was the obvious next move was. Well, what about hanging the cameraman upside down too, so you can get a nice shot looking at them, their their viewpoint. So we did that with a great assistant cameraman. And then he, he said, Mike, hang me upside down, hang me on a hook. I said, what? He said, hang me on a hook. So we've, uh, we've literally hung him on a hook with his camera. And we got this victim's point of view of this horrific scene. It was it's just the most extraordinary shot. Simone, did you find the violence very shocking? I did, yes, I did. I, I mean, I think it's very, very necessary that it was there. I think you couldn't make a, a film about that subject unless you show the violence and you have to show it as it, as it is, really. Which was the worst bit? Which bit of violence are you... Well, I think, I mean, for me, the most violent is, is the scene that Derek has, has the, the, the bottom. Yeah, yeah. It's the bottom. They can take over here any time they want. Just shut up. You won't stop them. To them, you're nothing. Nothing. The shit on their shoes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm not great about violence. I actually shut my eyes sometimes through a film if I see a knife coming towards people and, I, and the bottle. I always shut my eyes just before the bottle sort of comes right in. Uh, but you've got to show, essential to show in that scene, that Hoskins isn't doing it deliberately. He's just out of control. Yeah. Yeah. It's not cold-blooded murder. He just gets a no, bottle down time. And then when he sees what he's done, uh, so you had to do it that way. There was no other way I could think of to do it. And uh, so it's uh, excusable violence. You're all right, where's my toy? How did you uh, talk to Bob about that final scene? Because classically, of course, there is no script in that final scene. It is his face and all the emotions. What, how did you no, talk the, to Bob about it? No, the oh. thing in the, uh, the screenplay, don't forget, it starts off as someone wrote the thing and I was the guy that sat there writing it. And it is, whether he's in the car at the end, remember everything that happened in the last 48 hours. And that's, I think, how Bob acts it out, yes. He's remembering everything. And that's where it's all the mood changes, yep. Yeah, he goes through it and... Yes, in a, but in a way, what I wanted to do, because I spoke to him all the way through the scene, because you can't expect an actor to try and have connected thoughts. You can convey thought, but you can't have them doing it in the vacuum. So I talked him through it, really. And uh, so I said, you're absolutely furious. You want to get out of here, you're going to kill these bastards. And, and I'd do that, and I'd say, but, and then you'd think, Christ, when am I going to do it? I'll get out of this. And then gradually I talked him into saying, these guys have been bloody smart. And then gradually talk your way around to thinking, Christ, you know, they've, they've got me. They're, they're, 
I can't help admiring them. Well, I, I learned an incredible amount, especially from John, on that film. That was my first big film, and like, John's first shot, the first shot he planned, was the last shot in the film. He said, what I'm going to do, Bob, is sit you on the back of that cab, so I'm going to hold the camera on you for five minutes, and all you've got to do is think your way through the film. I said, you've got to be joking. Well, I'm just going to sit there. He said, I promise you, the camera will see you think. The camera and camera will smell me stink, I tell you that. Four, you've got to be joking, ain't you? Well, anyway, I did it. And when the rushes turned up, he said, here, look at that. And, I'm, yeah, and from there I, I learnt that the camera, that is the difference between stage acting and, and, and film acting. The camera can see you think. If you're thinking the right thing, whatever you're doing, it's right. I was driving too because there's not enough room in the car, so I had to direct him in the mirror, which was quite dangerous actually. I wouldn't dare do it these days. And there was a sound man on the floor, there was a guy in the boot, there was a cameraman, there was all of the, the only person that wasn't there was Piers Brosnan who was holding, supposed to be holding the gun. Because he had to get out of it, we had to have a camera there. So it was quite, except I nearly killed him because I got so involved in the mirror. As we got into Trafalgar Square, I suddenly saw this bus. I really nearly killed him. The double-decker bus he didn't want in the movie. <laughs> the and it was going to get into the bloody movie. It get you anyway. So it I went into the double-decker. It was really the insurance, insurance, claim, insurance claim. The insurance claim, the producer goes, he didn't know it. If he'd known it, he would have gone, but sir. From the moment uh, when it's revealed to us that it is about the IRA, mm. um, you can know that, well, nobody's going to win, but you can know that Harold Shand is not going to win. I was pleased that the IRA would win over a capitalistic thug, well, you know, even though you liked him. The IRA storyline caused problems when the film was completed. Well, we'd had a great time making the film. It was, it was a fabulous summer, the crew were terrific, we had a lovely time, the actors were marvellous, and everything had worked out well, it had been edited and all that. And uh, we were all feeling, I was especially feeling great about it. And then this blow fell. The guys who had given us the money, the company who were backing us, didn't like the film. They hated it. <laughs> they were ITC, they were called in those days. It was Lou Grade's organization. Although on the front of the film, I think it says Black Lion. But it was ITC, Lou Grade. And, and I said, well, what's the problem? Don't, you know, they don't like it? No, they hate it. Uh, because they feel that the film is, uh, well, several things that they're worried about. They feel it, it uh, the IRA connection is overplayed and they don't like it, and they feel it's unpatriotic. They feel it's too long, and anyway, they thought it would be better as a television piece. And the, the great organisation turned up and said, listen, we're burying this. This is going to be like, forget it, get our names off of this. Because it was, you know, right. Harold Shand is Thatcher's boy, isn't he, really? I do remember one of the things that came up it caused such controversy with the powers that be. Um, this is IRA propaganda, this film. Well, hang on, why it's IRA propaganda? If I show this film in my cinemas, the IRA will blow them up. And you think, well, Wait a well, minute, sorry, yeah. if this is IRA propaganda, why are they going to blow up your cinema? And I do remember someone saying, <laughs> don't get intellectual to me. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened in the end with the cut for America then? Well, what happened uh, in the end was, there was a very old, uh, now dead, uh, editor that they brought in uh, with a gang, who in fact, it became apparent, were recutting the film in the basement. It kind of ripped the innards out of the film. And then, of course, revoiced Bob. That was actually what was, what was going on, simultaneous to the final cut of the movie. So it was a very, very peculiar situation. They phoned me up and said, we've revoiced it. Right? Come and see it. We've done it really well. And I went to see it. And they recast, uh, they had sort of, they revoiced Harold Sham with a Wolverhampton accent. But they had done it very well. It actually looked like me speaking. They said, haven't we done it well? I said, you're nits. I'm slapping an injunction on this movie. You're nits. 
And it, well, you can't do that, yes, and I can. And fuck you and all, we're having it right, you know what I mean? That was their big mistake, mm. because then came the where Bob was going to sue him, but really suing them and going to get a huge degree of propaganda and, and the publicity about this because what's worse if you have a leading actor having his entire voice replaced i mean that's t and so we got they got we all got in fact a lot of actors big time actors from alec guinness burton mm -hmm. um, even warren Beatty. all these people were going to testify in court these the real actors, the guys that they wanted to make films for, you know, the really big timers, and they were, they were so snobbish, all that the, the Lou Grade organization, you know, we're going to get Alec Guinness saying that this is the worst thing you could ever do to, a, to an actor, a leading actor. Yeah. Dub his voice in his own language, and especially with a Wolverhampton accent. Mm. That would have just ruined them. It would have just been, they just couldn't take it, and they sold us the film. Dennis O'Brien, uh, who was George Harrison's partner came in and at offered handmade films. Yeah. At handmade films yeah. came in and offered uh, seven hundred thousand pounds and the UK TV rights to stay uh, with Lord Grade's company, um, but that the offending version of Bob revoiced or the offending cut film that version of it to be destroyed, and yeah. that's that's actually what happened. And George Harrison said. Uh, I said, if I'd have seen this film, Bob, I never would have born. I'm a pacifist. I'm a look at it. It's all it's all violence. <laughs> when you look at the Good Friday Night standing against the latest batch of gangster films, mm. how different is it? It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> they also they say it's the best British film ever made. I I can't object to that <laughs> i will accept it with every and, and agree and say great okay guys. it was a bit great gangster film well maybe other things too i'll accept what they all what anyone says uh, if it's praising and uh, <laughs> a lot of them say it's uh, one of the best british films ever made and i don't disagree thank you all very much indeed Tomorrow night begins with a tribute to the English cellist whose career was tragically cut short by multiple sclerosis. BBC Four celebrates the life and talent of Jacqueline Dupre tomorrow from seven. Next tonight, the latest edition. stuff and he said what film would we like to go and see tonight and I said well I'd like to see an American gangster film uh, set in East London and he said well Barry and Barry Hansen his way said well write it uh, then thought what to write you need a story and then the thing came together what about gangsters that were doing it for money and then of course it emerged uh, Harold Shand was the ultimate satirite. The thesis for Longer Friday was gangsterism, and that was the satirism, and that was capitalism, versus terrorism, idealism. I was writing it on uh, the Easter weekend, which is the most boring thing. It's the fastest thing I've ever wrote. It was way with, with serious issues, and, uh, and, of, uh, and with humour. So it's got a huge amount of ingredients which uh, actually attract, and it's, and it's a film. It's not a television, it's a film. And I think that all those factors help. So where did the original story come from? You've got these, these elements of London gangsterism and you've also got the, much, the, the explosive element, literally, of the IRA. I used to be a journalist in East London. And I, uh, the days I was doing my patch in East London, was the days of the craze and South East London was the Richardsons and I kept hearing all these stories, all these stories, all these stories. Um, and I had this fantasy, I, yeah, I would like to have done a great gangster film um, set in East London. Then one day I was working with Barry Hansen doing TV. Encouraging new writing and directing talent when he brought together the team to make The Long Good Friday. Simone Reynolds is the casting director who began her career at the Royal Court. This was the first feature film she'd cast. Derek 
Pete Thompson played Harold Shan's right-hand man, Jeff. Since then, he's become a household name as Charlie Fairhead in the long-running BBC series, Casualty. In the 1970s, Barry Keefe emerged as one of the most significant playwrights of his generation. His controversial script for The Long Good Friday, set in Thatcher's Britain, eerily predicted the development of London's docklands. Hello, how are you? Long time not seen you. Hello, Beth. How are you? Filmed as Margaret Thatcher took power, The Long Good Friday's release in 1981 marked the start of a new decade, a decade ripe with entrepreneurial excess and obsession with wealth. This was a film that said a lot about Britain. It was a depiction of a nation trying to find its confidence and be great again. John, why do you think um, The Long Good Friday still consistently tops the pool of the best films? Well, maybe because it's a good film. Maybe, <laughs> you know, uh, well, what is it? It's a, I suppose it's a mixture of lots of things. Huh? But it's really an, ent it's a, an involving film which uh, has terrific characters in it, great acting, I think, all round, and, um, and deals with, uh, in a very uh, not too heavy... ...links with the American Mafia to finance an ambitious scheme for a big property development in London's Dockland. Directed by John Mackenzie from a screenplay by Barry Keefe, Helen Mirren co-stars in a role that's so much more than the traditional gangster's mall. The Long Good Friday is more than just a gangster movie. It marks a high point in British movie making. More than 20 years after its initial release, it's still considered to be one of the greatest British films ever made. I'm bringing together the cast and crew of The Long Good Friday. They haven't been together for more than 20 years. John Mackenzie is one of Britain's finest directors. The Long Good Friday was his seventh feature, and he's continued to work in television and film ever since. Award-winning producer Barry Hansen lived up to his reputation for...